So uh, I'm like really delighted to be here, and I'll be talking about my learnings while building Blaze as a FOSS project. A uh, bit about me: my name is Akash Hamirvasia, and I build software at Razorpay, and I also do a lot of open source stuff when I get my free time. And you can check out some of my open source work at my GitHub. And if you want to follow my journey and stuff that I do along the way, you can check out my Twitter. And I also have a personal website about me bragging myself. So uh, before we get started, like what is Blaze? So Blaze is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing web app that I started building in around 2018. And the main goal of Blaze is to be very simple to use. And if you try out Blaze, uh, like I have a live deployment, and if you try it out, I think you'll experience that. You don't have to create an account. You don't have to register. It's straight to the point, simple file, to f file sharing between two devices, or even multiple devices. It works everywhere, so it's not limited by any operating system, any network protocols, or uh, any device that you're using. If your device supports a web browser, a modern web browser, it would work over there, and you can seamlessly share files. Uh, it has over 1,400 stars on GitHub. It's currently licensed as MIT. And you can check out the repo at this link. And it's also live at uh, this URL. Let's time travel back to 2018, when I actually got the idea of building Blaze. So it's 2018. I had a thought of building a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing application out of frustration. So it's 2018, right? And Sharing files between two devices is the most trivial thing you can ask in 2018. And there are a bunch of apps out there, but the entire file sharing space itself is very fragmented. There are multiple apps, multiple protocols, which might not work well with each other, might not work across devices. And again, those are hassle. They kind of slow you down while sharing a simple file. So I had a thought of building an app that would work across platforms. So it's not limited by your uh, operating system or the device. It works everywhere. And that kind of scratches away like some of those apps, like Share It or Zender. How many of you have used Share It? It was quite popular sometime. And there's also Apple's AirDrop, but that works only in the Apple ecosystem. So it's kind of fragmented, broken across platforms. Uh, then again, I wanted to build another, like build a file sharing app that works across networks. So it doesn't depend on whether you're connected in the same Wi-Fi. Right now, like every device, I guess, is connected to the largest network, which is the internet. And to share a file, if I need another network or another protocol, that's again, like reinventing the wheel, I feel. And that app should not store data on some server. So sharing files is not the same as storing files. And there are many apps like Google Drive, Dropbox, that do a bunch of stuff for you. Like they'll take your file, gladly store it, store it in the server without you having to even pay for it. And yep, that's not really, uh, I feel that's not a good thing when, you're, when you only want to share files and you want to keep it private and not give your files to some other company. And finally, that app should be very easy to use. No registrations, no sign up, no paid plans, nothing straight to the point. So the first steps were quite humble. I started prototyping the approach. Uh, I think I got the idea to build while I was preparing for an exam. And that is when like I had to share files from my phone to my laptop and so on. And yeah, like as hackers, if you get an idea and you are quite passionate about it, I think you sort of leave everything and start working on that idea to bring it to life. So yeah, I kind of during exams kept my studies at halt, although that also went quite well. Mm, but yeah, I spent quite some time prototyping the approach and made my first commit on December 7th, 2018. You can check out the repo, probably laugh at the code I wrote back then. And so I wanted to build it on web. That was clear because that's the most inclusive platform out there right now, which works on all devices and all operating systems. And that time, like I knew there is this protocol called WebSockets on web. And that, sub that allows you to do real-time communication between devices and servers. So I used that, but again, that wasn't really true peer-to-peer. -peer. There's still an intermediate server through which your file is going and uh, being sent to other servers. But hey, it was a prototype. I just wanted to see like, if this idea would even work in the first place. So you can see like how it looked like. Not a lot. I used plain JavaScript which, uh, to build it, which is quite unheard of. 
I think when you're starting like a new project these days, you think which JavaScript framework should I pick instead of actually building the product. Um, yeah, so I get a question quite often. Why did I go about making it open source? Because most of the open source projects are either, you know, libraries or tools that other developers might find useful. It's not, you rarely find very end-user uh, end oriented apps that are open source as well. And honestly, I don't have a very nice answer because most of my side projects back then were uh, already open source. I probably didn't even fully understand what open source meant, but I kept pushing my code on GitHub. And another reason was GitHub didn't have private repos in their free tier. So, and I didn't bother like creating another GitLab account just for like private repos. So I just pushed it on GitHub. So after like I built a prototype, I decided let's make it real. I, even though it wasn't peer to peer, it made it very simple for me to share files across devices. So I spent some more time, decided to make it even better. I spent my time building the V1 beta and uh, at this time around, I learned about this protocol protocol called WebRTC, which is quite common now because after COVID, like every app wants to integrate some video conferencing features and WebRTC is one of the ways you can kind of achieve this uh, capability. So I used WebRTC to, you know, establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection across devices and then share that data uh, between the devices by chunking the files. And again, improved the overall experience, wanted to keep it very simple, and also came up with a very nice logo. And these are some of the open source technologies I used at the time. Uh, Swelt, SAS for styling, the socket IO, which I used for the WebSockets implementation, Node.js server, and then Gulp for uh, the build pipeline. Um, I use Swelt mainly because, again, like, if you are building like a side project, it's very tempting to try out like, you know, the new hot technology that's out there which you might not be using at work. So again, that's why I decided to go with Svelte. Okay, coming to the big thing. So I just like decided to do a product hunt launch one day. I know like various teams and startups like plan for this product hunt launch very well in advance, but I just found like, okay, there's this site called product hunt. People post products there. Let me also just post it without like expecting much uh, uh, from the launch. And I thought it might help in getting feedback because again, like I was building this alone and if there's other people who try it out, they share feedbacks, I think that will be really useful. And the next day it became the product, uh, number one product of the day on Product Hunt. And uh, funnily enough, I wasn't even at home and I started getting like tweets and emails like, oh, the blaze is on the number one ranking and all that. And unfortunately, since I was using like a free server to uh, like run the Blaze instance because well I was using it personally and it was working fine, everybody like just tried it out and yeah, there were too many down times and I wasn't able to do much because I wasn't at home. So yeah, it's it's an experience I guess every engineer faces although they don't want to face but I think it's quite nice to ha to just learn and grow by the things that you learn in that time period. Uh, I also got a lot of negative feedbacks. Um, there are a lot of bugs. Again, it was beta, but nobody cares. Uh, if it's a software, it's meant to work. And uh, it has a lot of bugs. It ha it's very slow. And yeah, like, why did you even build it? But there are also a lot of, you know, positive feedback that I received. So like, usually even on Hacker News, or most of these communities, right, you see like people just typing out loud, like they'll probably like, tear you down with all their words. But even there, like there are some people who will uh, give you motivation and, you know, suggest you stuff that you can try. So for me, like people told me, maybe you should try Go instead of Node because that might be able to handle the socket connections better. And yeah, a bunch of them that told me, yeah, don't, uh, don't even listen to other reviews. Uh, I think you're doing great. So since I got to the number one product, I knew that Blaze is solving a problem. It, it File sharing is probably a quite hard thing even today, and maybe that's why people even wanted to try it in the first place. So I spent more time trying to improve Blaze even more. I kind of thought of an idea for sharing files between multiple devices. So like you join a room, one device shares a file, and all the devices that are connected immediately get the file. And that kind of reminded me of a feature or a protocol called BitTorrent, 
a torrent for file sharing. And yeah, I found this open source implementation uh, for web torrent, which basically implements the BitTorrent protocol and allows you to uh, do the torrenty thingies on the web. So yeah, I re-architected the entire app around web torrent. How many of you have used torrent, by the way? I, I don't know if people will raise hands because it's it has a very illegal you know vibe to it but i think uh, like today right when web3 decentralized is very much on the hype i think bittorrent made this it was decentralized forever i don't know since when so yeah like even in like 2019 2020 whenever i built place i could call it a dap or a decentralized dap even though it wasn't mainstream so yeah, made it a, an even better PWA. So PWA is like uh, progressive web apps. It allows you to build uh, web apps which are more tightly integrated and can leverage the features of your native device. So today, like if you try out Blaze, if you share a file, you get the nice share tray there you would be able to see Blaze as well as an option to share, even though it's a web app and it's quite uh, uh, an amazing experience to see a web app integrated so well with uh, other native features. Also got a new logo. <laughs> So, and this I called uh, Blaze V2. Uh, fun fact, there was never a V1 because V1 beta failed so badly and I had to re-architect everything, so I decided to call it V2. And these are some of the open source technologies I used. And again, the power of open source, like I have just mentioned like what, six, seven technologies here, but there's so many JavaScript libraries that I'm using. Um, and you know, because of the openness and because of like people contributing, it's so easy to swap out libraries build more abstractions around it. And I think that's one of the more, uh, you know, bigger pros of open source and people contributing that is often overlooked. Uh, at this time, I also started looking for sponsorships because again, I didn't want another product and launch failure-ish thingy with my server blowing up. So I thought let's try, let's see, like let's try contacting companies who have like open source uh, funds. Maybe they might consider Blaze. So I reached out to uh, DigitalOcean and they were kind enough to like start sponsoring Blaze in 2020. And yeah, since then it has been running on a Bla uh, DigitalOcean droplet. And yeah, it's be, it's doing quite good since then. Uh, I do suggest try out DigitalOcean, like the complexity involved with other cloud providers is kind of uh, eliminated completely when you're just interacting with a bare simple droplet, you get like complete freedom to do various things. Okay, so that brings us to now. I'm sure like you don't want to just listen the entire Blaze thing. You want to like learn some useful stuff as well. So what have I learned about FOSS by this whole Blaze project? The first learning is contributors come and go. It's rare for someone to make more than two PRs in a project. So whenever like uh, there's this uh, thought process of open source your project or you know you should probably open source it and put it out there people often like also say like you'll get contributors in return and that's not a good idea to you know open uh, that's not the only motivation that you should have to uh, open source a project i think there are more issue contributors out there than code contributors they'll gladly open issues in your repositories and then they'll go away if you ask them like for more details they won't even respond some of them do not saying like, all of them but yeah many of them won't take the effort of actually also fixing the uh, issue also because I mean the code is there you face the issue you, you are probably the best person who will be able to reproduce the issue as well so maybe I think contributors should also uh, take a chance in also trying to fix the issue and since contributors come and go it's important to maintain a contribution guide in your project because if a new contributor comes and they are interested in contributing they're not able to find like where to get started how to set up the project no one's gonna come to your project so maintaining like a, a nicely documented contribution guide that's always up to date and works is a very important thing, at least that I've learned. And it's also important to have some good first issues. So, uh, and actually even I find this important, like whenever I look at some open source project that I feel like contributing in, I often look for like good first issues, smaller issues that are very well scoped. That is something that I can try fixing and take a hit at. In Blaze, uh, new contributions mostly come during Oktoberfest. Uh, October is mostly like the open source e month of the year where like the most number of activities happen. Again, like the goal is not really open source. Sometimes it's for getting the free t-shirt and swags, but uh, 
yeah at least people are getting aware of open source which is a good thing so yeah th this is the first learning that contributors come and go second learning is being a sole maintainer of a project is not easy so as a maintainer i have to review issues review pull requests keep documentation up to date manage releases plan features for next release right and finally if i get some time write some code too and that was not the initial plan right like i started building a project because i wanted to write code and get it out there and for a sole maintainer like me like i'm not like saying that i don't want to do all this but it just slows me down i have to spend my free time reviewing pr and helping others instead of actually improving the end uh, open source project the third learning is for software is still limited to tech nerds like you and me and i think this is quite important to consider because many people only care about the software and most of them care whether it's free but only some know what's open source and honestly like most projects out there there are many nice fos projects but they are not getting enough visibility because people don't really care whether it's open source if it's not showing up on google or if people are not talking about it they won't spend time searching an open source alternative like you and me so as i mentioned fos projects are again many people expect a software to just work they don't care whether it's open source and most don't even want to go through the hassle of self hosting and well self hosting for a common man i don't think they even know what self hosting would even mean and it's fine if this convenience comes at a price so if you as a fos uh, developer you know you are maintaining maintaining an instance but you want others to pay for it so that you keep it running i think it's fine but you should get your fos project more visible you should get it out there and make it so that people are able to use it and i think some projects like vlc blender they have actually uh, cracked it quite well because today like if i want a video player the first thing that comes to my mind is vlc even for someone who is not into tech or not into open source they'll also get okay vlc is probably the thing that i should first install to play videos and it's quite accessible you can find it on the download page you can probably there's also like windows app and all that for downloading it directly so vlc blender these are like apps that are out there people know of them and i think every project out there should also try to do this so again this is there like we need to make more people aware of open source but also fos project or fos software should work without requiring much setup from the user even for me like if i find a nice fos project but if i require like a long self hosting process i might just skip it and you know use some other alternative in case of blaze like uh, i uh, i have like uh, solved this problem somehow by having like a live deployment that runs um like uh, 24 by 7 it keeps running as long as people don't just bombard it ho hopefully and yeah there's like uh, one click self deploy buttons as well that's available so if you if you're using digital ocean or heroku there's like one click button you self host it instantly on your own infra and again for the tech nerds like you and me there's like one line script and up to date documentation to self host blaze uh, using docker so i have a wild idea over here perhaps it's already discussed and tried before but imagine if uh, owning a small server was as common as owning a mobile or a laptop even for like an average joe and self hosting apps is as easy as clicking an install button and getting it on that server that you just got so i think this itself would like get a lot of visibility i'm not sure if like this has been done before it probably has the one click self deploy buttons those kind of achieve this so i think um, yeah it's a, it's an idea i think as as fos it might actually help other fos projects to get more visibility learning number 4 so spreading knowledge about oss open source licenses and ethics is key so <clears throat> usually like uh, new people who get started with open source uh, we just tell them open source is uh, open software you can do whatever you want but that's actually not the case first thing is open source is not equal to free and this is probably clear by now because you are attending a fos uh, conference so any open source project is not really free to use and it's not necessary that a free project is also open source free software is open source even open source softwares have restrictions um so you can't really just take any open source software redistribute it or modify it and redistribute it there are restrictions and i think uh, the knowledge of license even like my understanding is sort of limited it's still limited to mit and gpl but uh, i think yeah 
people should be made more aware of the restrictions with open source software. The fifth learning, it's hard to make everything open. So software is not just code. There's a bunch of things. There's UI, UX design. There's discussions around how you want to do something. There's brainstorming and ideation. And there's like a few third party tools too. Yeah. So as a sole uh, maintainer, like for me, I have an idea of something for Blaze. I have it in my head. I also have the UI in my head. But I don't want to spend time designing the UI on Figma and putting it on the open source project for someone else to contribute. Because I already have it in my head. I can directly write the code and get it out there. So as a, like, a single person maintaining a project, it's quite hard to you know do the entire process of developing a software, like from the design, from like discussing with others, from brainstorming and ideating with others. Uh, documentation helps. And you know there are collaborative tools that have made this simpler. But again, it's quite hard to you know just open your mind and make it available to everyone instantly. Uh, the last learning, so sponsorships and donations should be more accessible and available to FOSS projects. And think about it, like what do you think a simple donation to a developer or a maintainer of a project can do? It can first of all motivate the indie developer to work and uh, work more on FOSS projects and also support their efforts. Second thing is it can probably pay the bills of their uh, project if it's being hosted on some server. And it can encourage more projects in FOSS. If there are people donating to other maintainers, there would be other maintainers also interested in contributing even further because uh, they are seeing like they are being compensated of their work. In case of sponsorships, which are a bit more uh, larger in scale, uh, they can help in maintenance of large FOSS softwares that is you know heavily depended on. And it can also allow you know building viable business options over the FOSS project. And again, we have seen like many FOSS softwares that are open to the core, but have built like really nice businesses around it as well. And also, sponsor sponsorships can encourage more uh, full-time contributions and like teams to form to build and work on the FOSS projects. So those were the uh, some of the things that I learned while bl building Blaze. Um, and a few more side projects along the way. Um, it almost brings me to the end of the talk. And for Blaze, like what's next? Uh, there's a roadmap, public roadmap for V3 that I'm currently working on. If you see when I opened the issue, it was in 2021 June. So it's already one year. And yeah, like I work on it in my free time. And uh, whenever I feel like working on Blaze, I look at the issues that are there and I slowly you know, work on it. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Uh, let's connect. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take it up. Are there any questions? Yeah, yeah. You, you, I think you already touched up on this. You were like telling, you it seemed to me that building an open source kind of gets lonely sometimes. So how do you make it even more fun and collaborative? Like you launched on product and right? So like, but what about the other products? Like, how can they make it more fun and collaborative? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I think one way is like getting the word out. You know, like coming to a conference like this and you know sharing like what you're working on. That itself would get you like a lot of people uh, excited, and you know you'll also get like some feedback. Um, and yeah, like even I'm kind of scared of posting products on Product Hunt and Hacker News. You know, thinking that people might just you know, just break it down and, you know, show all the negative things that you have done. So, but yeah, you have to, you know, get the word out somehow, you know, get people to see your projects. And in terms of like loneliness, I think, uh, well, we are here, you can connect with us and that would, I guess, help you in that. Um, hi, Akash. Yeah, here. Where is it? Oh, hello. Uh, so uh, you had a slide which said uh, contributors come and go. Uh, Suppose that weren't the case, uh, how much value do you see in it? Like, uh, is there value in having the uh, same set of contributors contributing to your project for a long time? Or uh, is it just the same? Like, you just need like 10 contributors, and if that's the enough flux, that's also fine. So, I think it's better to have a small number of contributors making a much more contribu contributions than many contributors making little contributions. Because even when I make a contribution, like the first contribution to an open source project, I kind of get the feel of the code base. And I understand how things are working. 
and if i am able to vibe with the project and if i see it's actually solving a problem that even i'm facing it's better for a, an existing contributor to contribute more to a project because they have already crossed that threshold that a new contributor would have to when they are trying to contribute nice such a nice project i instantly went to the application that you have made and it's very uh, how do i say it's very easy to easy fr like friendly application easy to use multi device and anywhere and that's such a like for past 5 years i think you have done amazing job in like not just building the application but the user interface and the presentation as well and like communicating your ideas i think that's uh, more of a inspiration other developers should take like when they are developing any project like stick to it and i think you have made a great thank you it was a really great feedback thank you so much thank you The last question. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the contributors are expecting from you? So, so far you would have been uh, there in this uh, journey, right? So, of course, you would have uh, learned from what is the contributors are expecting. As you said, they are coming and uh, going. They are rising above. So, apart from that, have you seen in your experience how the contributors are expecting and what is their expectations from you as well? Hmm. So I think like uh, maybe con so there's like multiple things uh, as a contributor. First thing is like if there's like a nice roadmap for the project, like the long term vision, and that is kind of missing in Blaze as as like again a public document because it is again in my head like okay this is the next feature that I want to build. This is where I see Blaze going, and I think if that is missing in your project. And you don't have a lot of issues. You're seeing like the, even the maintainer is not very active. Contributors will lose interest over time. Plus, again, it also you know has inherent popularity of your project. Um, if there's like a, a, a FOSS software that is very popular, you'll automatically you know have contributors who are trying hard to contribute, but you know maybe their PRs are not worth it or it's not up to the mark. And in case of like projects that are you know not yet at that threshold. It's hard to get contributors again because contributors think it, it's not popular. It might not add to my resume, or it might not do anything. So that's I think that's one of the reasons. Okay, I think we are done. Thank you for your time. You have been a great audience.